the M2 mortar, America's primary light mortar of World War II, also seeing service in Korea and Vietnam, highly mobile with excellent range, the M2 mortar was an important part of company level fire support. Mortars were essential and used in all theaters of World War II. However, on film, mortar teams are often overlooked with their essential role underrepresented and misunderstood. So let's take a look at the M2 mortar and some of the movies it's been featured in. The M2 mortar was a simple, highly effective weapon, but it's a bit more than just a tube. There's a base plate for a stable platform. There's a mortar cup, which connects the plate and the tube. It also houses the firing pin. It's what the mortar round strikes when it falls down the tube. A soldier can arm and drop around down the tube, and it fires on its own. Of course, getting it on target, and most importantly not hitting your own men, meant this was a role requiring skill and training. Aiming the M2 was done with a bipod assembly, which attached to the tube. Attached to the bipod was a sight. These came in their own protective carrying case. Adjustments to the mortar were made with a traversing hand wheel, an elevation crank on the bipod. Rounds for the M1 and M2 were primarily high explosive, but there were also illumination rounds and phosphorus smoke. The rounds contained both a propellant at the base, allowing them to be launched from the tube, as well as the warhead. The rounds needed to be kept dry, a sometimes challenge in the Pacific Theater. M2 mortar rounds had a range of about two to 300 meters, but propellant could be increased for each round by adding increments, which could be fastened to the stabilizing fins. By adding four increments, the maximum range of the M2 could be pushed to about 2,000 yards or 1,800 meters. Changing the propellant also allowed mortars to change their firing arc, allowing shells to be lobbed behind buildings or terrain. Fantastic. The M2 was a licensed production designed by French weapons engineer Edgar Grant. It shared much in common with its bigger brother used in World War II, the 81mm M1 mortar, again a rarity on film. The M2 was smaller, but provided great portable fire support to American infantry at ranges greater than grenades could be thrown or launched. A typical mortar team was five men, and they divided carrying the mortar components. The base plate and tube individually weighed just under 13 pounds, with the bipod weighing another 16 and a half pounds, with the system altogether weighing 42 pounds or 19 kilograms. Three men or more were usually dedicated to carrying just ammunition. Rounds complete! Rounds complete! Skip! More ammo! Go! Go! A trained mortar team could fire a well-aimed 18 rounds a minute, with HE rounds having a blast radius of up to 35 feet or 10 meters. Teams with good communication could establish a wall of mortar fire. The 60 millimeter mortar had one of the best ranges of any light mortar of World War II. 60,000 M2 mortars were made during World War II alone. Mortar sections in World War II were typically part of the weapons platoon in a rifle company, with the section leader being a sergeant in rank. A mortar section was made up of 16 to 20 men. A rifle company could count on three mortar teams for immediate and indirect fire support. All right, I want mortars and grenade launchers on that building till it's gone. When it's gone, I want first to go straight in. Forget going around. Everybody else follow me? Yes, sir. Light mortars gave infantry greater control over quick and indirect fire, as opposed to requesting artillery or naval fire 
which needs to be radio requested and not always available or as accurate. For paratroopers, mortars were usually the only indirect fire available. The M2 size meant it was ideal for paratroopers, assuming mortar teams could assemble after the drop and the mortar equipment stayed attached to the paratrooper during the jump. Every mortar team member was armed, typically with an M1 carbine, expected to act as a rifleman when mortars ran out of ammunition. They also needed to be able to defend their position. Mortarmen, like machine gunners, were always important enemy targets. Mortars can drastically alter defensive and offensive tactics. Mortars can devastate an attacking enemy without ever being seen. When attacking entrenched positions or machine gun nests, mortars can be used outside the sight or range of these fixed positions, able to destroy them without an enemy position able to return fire. And one machine gun's holding us back. A little more to the right. Attacking an enemy armed with mortars sometimes meant rushing them, trying to run within their minimum firing range. Sometimes the only answer to a mortar section was another mortar section. Mortars sometimes dueled, even out of sight from each other, relying on information from spotters. There is a good example of this in Siege of Jadotville, when an Irish peacekeeping force is under fire from mortars, devastating their fixed defensive positions. On film there are many creative ways mortars have been used, most of which are actually possible, though highly dangerous. Mortars could even be used against tanks, as shown here, though they were not overly accurate against moving targets for a direct hit. Tanks, however, could be vulnerable to even HE mortar rounds, as their armor was thinnest on top. This is especially true of poorly built light Japanese tanks, that could be essentially rattled apart by an HE round. Primarily if you see mortars firing at a tank, it is to kill the enemy infantry supporting it. Two of the more famous scenes involving mortar rounds are from Saving Private Ryan and Hacksaw Ridge, where they are used as grenades. This is possible and there are several heroic accounts of them used this way in World War II, but it was highly dangerous, as World War II mortar rounds generally carried impact fuses, meaning they detonated on impact with the ground, as opposed to a grenade, which has a timer fuse. The mortar rounds used here just needed the arming wire removed, followed by an impact to be live. If you missed through, you had no time to take cover. Though if the bomb didn't land on its head, it also might not explode. Though mortars are a rare thing on film, HBO's The Pacific is the one excellent standout example, following real-life mortarman Eugene Sledge and Meryl Snafu Shelton. Sledge thoroughly documented his experience in this role in the Pacific Theatre. The miniseries highlights the dangers of being a mortarman, as well as the experience many shared also serving as riflemen. Second squad, let's go. Why us? Because your squad's low on ammo. Brother, get out of hell! If it means any damn difference to you, I'm coming with you. So grab a rifle and move! A second production highlighting the mortar and its crucial role against defensive positions and machine gun nests is Go For Broke from 1951. It's a progressive film for its time, highlighting the contributions of Japanese American soldiers serving in the European theater. Approximately 30,000 Japanese Americans served in the US military during World War II. Alright, I'm Johnny. Thanks for watching this review on the important role mortars played during World War II and beyond. I have no direct experience handling mortars, so if you do, please share any insights on the subject in the comments section, and I hope to see you in the next video.